afternoon, friends. Uh, yeah, my name is Jared. I am a cartoonist from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Uh, and since this, this is a different part of the world, you probably won't know my work, but I uh, publish in newspapers in the Netherlands and also in Germany, in France, and in Switzerland. And uh, the reason I'm here today with uh, my counterpart, Jeremy, is, uh, is actually twofold. Um, one is uh, because I run a website for international political cartooning uh, called Cartoon Movement. And this year we're doing a project um, with the Dutch uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, a cartoon competition, an international cartoon competition, which is uh, taking place in over 40 countries um, called My Piece, Your Piece. And towards the end of uh, the, our hour here together, I'll explain the competition and I'll explain the why and how of it. Um, and the other reason I'm here is uh, because the embassy has a program called Co-Create SA, which is a platform that allows um, Dutch and South African counterparts to exchange their views. And in this case, uh, we as cartoonists are here together today to exchange our views and to uh, explore satire and what we feel to be uh, the limits of satire. So, uh, Jeremy, can you maybe give a short introduction of yourself and then we can <coughs> get underway? So, my name is... Uh, Germ, uh, but my parents prefer to call me Jeremy now. <laughs> and uh, I'm a freelance cartoonist. Uh, this is my tenth year. I draw for multiple uh, publications, currently for the Sunday Times and for the Daily Maverick. Um, but in the past, I worked as news in the NCA, um, as well as the New Age. Um, so, which in itself is a, um, a great, a great story. Um, and uh, I have. Uh, Two books out currently, both published by Penguin, and uh, that's pretty much my story. Uh, my focus predominantly is on political satire. Controversial stuff, uh, as we'll see uh, later on in the presentation, he's not uh, shy of uh, putting himself out there and uh, making some really sharp critiques <coughs> in uh, individual form. Um, so as I mentioned, we're here today to uh, uh, have a conversation with you to, to uh, talk about um, the limits of satire, and we're going to do that by showing you some of our own cartoons that were controversial, uh, and some of uh, cartoons made by others that were considered to be controversial, that either insult or provoke, uh, or in any other way, uh, were not well received by. Uh, if I may, interject, yeah. uh, this is if you want it to be, can be interactive. If you do have questions, if you want to throw something in at any stage, please do. Uh, Definitely, we're not, we're not here to preach. No, exactly. As I said. It's a dialogue, a conversation, um, so there's definitely questions, remarks, anything goes. Um, what we wanted to do is because we're uh, a Dutch cartoonist and a South African cartoonist uh, here together, uh, and that's pretty special, um, is we wanted to explore a little bit how our societies differ. Um, because we, uh, we had some conversations leading up to giving this talk here today, and uh, we both believe as cartoonists uh, that you can measure the freedom in any given society by uh, the social satire that is allowed in that society. And you can uh, look at political cartoons that are published in any given country and see how free that country is. Uh, in a free country, you can criticize your leadership. Uh, in a free country, you are free to make fun of uh, things that you consider to be wrong in society. Uh, but that's that said, um, it's also the case that Every particular society has its own subject which are pretty sensitive, which are difficult to touch, which um, are sure to stir up controversy. Um, and uh, the funny thing is, is that these subjects are different for every society. So, so we had some conversations on um, what the taboos or the difficult subjects are in, in the Netherlands and what they are uh, in, in South Africa. And we wanted to, to basically start off with that. So our talk is called um, uh, Depends on the <coughs> Uh, in Afrikaans, which is quite similar to Dutch, uh, or how to get yourself killed over a cartoon in South Africa or in the Netherlands. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we start off with a cartoon by uh, Jeremy, basically, to kick off uh, what we consider to be satire. Yeah, so uh, a, a, base, a basic understanding of satire is that it's, it's ridiculing um, authorities uh, for the sake of betterment or improvement. And uh, so this was a cartoon that I drew for Eyewitness News um, some time back, um, at which stage there was a big discussion about um, satire and, and how people were misunderstanding it, particularly in political um, authority. And at the top left we can see Kenny Kennedy, and he, he wrote a, a scathing letter in which, uh, you might remember it was an open letter, um, and uh, he used a lot of exaggeration, um, and that's, that's what one would 
call hyperbole. Um, of course, we all know Zapiro's Rape of Justice cartoon, which is a metaphor. It wasn't a literal rape, which we might remember. It caused a lot of controversy for that. Um, we might remember uh, Brett Murray's painting, The Spear. That was, of course, a parody of a famous uh, Lenin painting. And a parody would be an imitation, as you know, of, of, of another work. And, of course, um, the, the president is a joke. Um, it would be, um, you know, it's a joke of something that you don't take seriously. Um, and that would just be a brief, a brief overview of what satire, <laughs> what satire would be. Kind of different form from satire. Yeah. Uh, so uh, when when I was putting together this presentation, I thought of what Dutch cartoon I would want to start with. And actually, I'm going to start with not one of my own, but one that was made by um, I think the most controversial cartoonist in the Netherlands. Um, it's a guy called Gregory Gregorius Nexwold in Dutch, um, which translate a bit to Gregory shot in the head. And he's about offen as offensive as you can get as a cartoonist. So this cartoon depicts the Prophet Muhammad having intercourse with Anne Frank, Anne Frank being one of the most revered um, Dutch people of all time, at least in the Netherlands, but also across the world. And of course, the Prophet Muhammad, uh, very revered among Muslims. So this is really uh, a cartoon that takes um, insulting to uh, about as far as you can go. Um, and the fact is that he actually got arrested uh, for, for his work, for, for cartoons he did back in 2008. And to my knowledge, he is the only Dutch cartoonist to ever get arrested uh, for his work. Uh, and uh, police officers, ki officers came to his house at 6 in the morning. They confiscated his computer. They uh, took his hard drive, took his sketchbook, uh, and arrested him uh, for allegedly spreading hatred uh, with his cartoon. Uh, and this guy is a, uh, mostly considered to be a right-wing cartoonist, and his uh, stance is mostly directed against Muslims and against immigrants. So I've got a couple more here. This is a Muslim, and uh, the uh, caption reads, uh, this Muslim is doing uh, Islamic charity. And then he's saying, it's my duty to help this constipated bear. <laughs> to give you an idea of the things he makes. This is another one of him. It's, uh, it reads, progressive Dutch people are still optimistic, and it's an attack on left-wing people. Um, and this is supposed to be an immigrant, the guy with the gun, uh, and the other guy with the peace sign on the back is supposed to be uh, a left-wing Dutch people, a Dutchman. And he says, oh, don't worry, this is only the second generation of immigrants. It'll sort itself out. So he was very tough uh, on, on immigrants. He was very tough on, on Islam, uh, and actually got him arrested. Uh, so I just wanted to, to gauge the audience here on, on how they feel about these kinds of workers. What Was it um, legitimate to think to arrest this guy for the cartoons he made or not? I, I'd like to show the hands of people who think the guy should have been arrested for his cartoon. Anyone? Wow, that's good. Actually, it was considered to be a very, very controversial arrest in the Netherlands, and especially um, the way they did it, by invading his home at 6 o'clock in the morning, um, it felt more like state intimidation than uh, a, a legal pursuit of justice. And in the end, the case was dismissed, uh, but sadly, or sadly, the, the cartoons actually stopped making cartoons, so, so the aim was achieved. And, uh, you know, I'm not a fan of this, these kinds of cartoons, but uh, it, it was a cartoonist that really did push the limits. Um, and one thing I, I do suspect, I'm not sure, but I do suspect the fact that he also made fun of, of national, Dutch national symbols like Anne Frank kind of helped facilitate his arrest because that's one of the taboos that we have in Dutch society is anything related to the Holocaust, to Jews, to World War II, um, <laughs> you cannot touch. And that's, uh, yeah. Is it the cartoonist or the publisher? In this case, uh, what do you mean, the responsibility? <coughs> I mean, somebody's got to publish the cartoon. Yeah, yeah, and this was actually, uh, well, this, uh, he published mostly online, but he, uh, he had also, he, had, he, was, he was publishing on uh, the weblog of a Dutch, uh, a famous Dutch, or pretty famous Dutch TV presenter called Theo van Gogh, the guy who was murdered. Uh, um, so, so he did have a podium, and it, he did reach uh, a lot of people with his work. There is, incidentally, the strange phenomenon in which um, worldwide editors tend to back off even after they've published um, cartoons that might uh, cause controversy. Um, the cartoonist, even though um, gets passed by the editor, um, th there is a trend in which editors t tend not to take responsibility for publishing it. And the cartoonist often gets the, the, um, the bullet. That's true. Not quite sure why that is, um, but it's, <coughs> for this. It's, not a, it's not a South African thing necessarily, it's global. Yeah, and in this case, this cartoonist 
published pretty much without an editor. So, so you just, you know, you send it to off to interested websites, but it wasn't like he published in a newspaper. So that's why he was. I think that was uh, why he was held yeah. directly accountable. Um, so and trick. Oh, another question. Were there any right wing people in the Netherlands who? Yeah, a, a lot actually. Well, um, there were uh, both left and right a lot of people who protested. So uh, on the one hand, you had cartoonists, both Dutch cartoonists and international cartoonists, who really were outraged at this, at the fact that a cartoonist was uh, uh, was arrested for his work, that it really was a direct violation of freedom of expression. Uh, and uh, in, in Holland, we do have a law that says you cannot spread hatred. And he was accused by a Muslim organization of spreading hatred with his cartoons. So you might argue that it, his arrest was legal, but then the way they did it, by invading his home at 6 o'clock in the morning with almost a SWAT team and very violent, violently arresting him, uh, that was the, uh, the adding element that uh, contributed to the outrage. And the opposition parties, politicians protested, and uh, even a lot of left-wing people protested because uh, they felt that even though they did not agree with you know, what he had to say, they thought he had the right to say it. Uh, interestingly though, it's not likely that a South African cartoonist would be arrested oh, uh, at, at this point in time. Our constitution is very uh, robust um, and there's a strong um, uh, support for satire. And in fact, Albie Sachs will be a bit later. Uh, he's one of those um, advocates who uh, ruled in favor um, of the protection of satire. So it's, it, if there were any arrests, um, and as far as I know, there haven't been any arrests in South African post apartheid history um, of cartoonists. If there were to be, it would most likely be politically driven. Yeah, we'll see. Maybe this was a catalyst in the sense that I, I, won't, I wouldn't see this happening anytime soon again in the Netherlands. So this was, this was a one off, but it was uh, an, interesting, an interesting one. Um, so moving on, uh, if there are no more questions about this one. Does anyone know this guy? He's uh, one of the most famous, I think the most famous Dutch politician we have. You know who he is? He's called Geer Builders and he's a uh, anti, also a right-wing politician, very anti-immigrant anti as well. Um, and uh, he uh, combats in Dutch society, in Dutch politics, what he calls to be the Islamization of Europe, the fact that, in his view, um, Islamic people or Muslim people are taking over Europe, and he combats them by uh, proposing some really draconian measures, such as the thing he proposed uh, two years back was to have a tax on the headscarf that Muslim women wear. So if you wear a headscarf as part of your Muslim faith, you have faith, you have to pay an extra tax, and he called this the rag hat tax. Well, this guy is really is very, very good food for us cartoonists because of the things he says and the things he does. Uh, but uh, we have to be careful because, as I said, um, things we can not do is uh, make any parallels to, uh, to Hitler, make any parallels to uh, the Holocaust. And uh, if you do that, you get in trouble. So this guy really doesn't like to be compared to this guy. <laughs> Even though his treatment of Muslims, well, you, you know, you could see parallels. I'm not saying there are, but you could. Um, and one cartoonist found out the hard way that you cannot do this. So this is uh, a cartoon from uh, 2006. It was made by a Dutch cartoonist called Adrian Soutebroek, uh, who worked for a leftist opinion site, actually the same uh, website I did work for. Uh, and this one caused a national outrage in the Netherlands. Um, it, was, it, it portrays uh, Geert Wilders as a concentration camp guard um, as he is directing a group of immigrants uh, to the shower. And shower, uh, uh, douche or shower is uh, a euphemistic uh, way to say they're going to the gas chamber. Uh, and they're all wearing a T. They're labeled with a big T on their chests, uh, which stands for Duig, uh, which is Dutch for scum. So it's really a quite, quite a harsh criticism of how Bilders uh, treats immigrants. Uh, but this crossed the line. This, this, uh, this not only outrages Wilders, it also outrages everybody in the Netherlands because these kinds of comparisons in Dutch society just cannot be made. And in the end, the cartoon was retracted. And actually, also this cartoon, cartoon has actually stopped working uh, shortly after uh, he published this cartoon. So, um, and then we get to, to uh, a cartoon by Jerome because uh, when we start talking about uh, the taboos and about how in, in the Netherlands we deal with uh, Hitler comparisons, uh, he told me that uh, you can get away with a lot more in this area. In, in yeah, strange, yeah, strangely enough, we can. Yeah. Um, it's not really 
it's, it's kind of weird, and I mean, we know this with the recent uh, Wits SOC um, drama happened with the Hitler, with the Hitler comments. And um, in South Africa, yeah, we definitely can uh, make references to, to Hitler, and, <laughs> and we do. Um, it, whether it be comical or be serious. Um, in fact, in this particular cartoon, this isn't related. This is, uh, this was, uh, this was, when was this now? It was a year ago, I think, yeah. Um, and that, what happened was uh, J.C. Duarte, uh, at that stage, uh, didn't quite distance herself um, from uh, a, Hitler, a, a pro Hitler Facebook status update uh, that came from within the ANC somewhere. Um, and so, as you can see in the second panel, um, um, I'm alluding to uh, <laughs> um, a Hitler reference. Um, but as you were saying, you can't get away with that kind of thing in. Exactly. On your side of yeah. the world, yeah. Um, so actually, uh, the guy, um, Pierre Bildes, he actually got so obsessed with the fact that he got compared to Hitler a number of times. This, this cartoon has caused the outrage that I showed you. It wasn't the only time. Um, it, it happened a number of times. And last year, he came out and he said, he, um, he said I'm going to sue everyone and anyone who compares me to Hitler. Um, so of course, that was great food for cartooning. Uh, and uh, I had to do a cartoon on that. But um, I couldn't do a straight out comparison to Hitler because that would get me into trouble. So I tried. I had to find a more subtle way of making fun of him, of poking fun of him. Uh, and, and I kind of found a way where I invited the audience to, to draw their own conclusions, uh, literally. So, so what I did is I, I kind of created a connected dots below the nose. Uh, and then, who dares? And then actually that kind of worked. Because a lot of people, uh, and this is the Dutch version, but a lot of people posted it to Facebook like this, so they kind of, uh, uh, made the Hitler mustache and posted it. So, so it kind of went a little bit viral. Uh, and uh, in that way, I could get away with it. And uh, the fun thing is, I know we actually saw it himself because it was part of a, uh, a Wilders cartoon exhibition at the Press Museum in Amsterdam. And he thought it was funny. So this was actually one that stayed within the lines, uh, but one that I had to really think about how to approach it so that I wouldn't stay within the lines. I have another one uh, by, by German. Well, in, well, in terms of insulting. Yeah. Uh, so, um, Islam gets a bad rap a lot of the time. Um, but um, Christianity does too. And when the previous Pope stepped down, um, I didn't uh, see it as an opportunity to give him any grief. I mean, to, to step back from giving him grief. Um, Catholic Church, as we know, is, well, the Vatican is shrouded in all kinds of controversy. And so, this was merely just a comment um, uh, of, of, of what <coughs> I think. Uh, he's headed towards. Um, he's dead now, um, and I, I don't think it really matters. But um, I'm sure the uh, the devil is pretty happy that he's dead now, um, <laughs> since he didn't. He wasn't particularly keen on on um, opening up about uh, the pedophilia happening within the Vatican and all that kind of stuff. So um, so he was in this particular cartoon. It was it caused a lot of uh, outrage. It was published for. Uh, it was published by Arbiter's News. And um, and initially, uh, the uh, cross that he's uh, carrying uh, didn't have any any uh, labelling on it. But just to contextualise a bit more, I decided to um, suggest that he was um, part of that was part of his burden, um, the, uh, the controversy, and it wasn't necessarily himself, um, since he represented um, the organisation and not necessarily himself. The comments more about the organisation, and not so much. Him personally. So, but you, you you fought twice before doing this cartoon, probably. Yeah, yeah because because uh, when you do when you do a cartoon like this, you get a lot of uh, um, complaints uh, from um, all sectors, um, and um, and you should be able to do cartoons like this because these are incredibly powerful people. Um, these these people can can change the way in which the world does things by a simple comment. Uh, so. Uh, they are in positions of power, and they're the kind of people that uh, we should certainly not back down uh, from commenting on. But again, as I said, not him personally, it's more about the, the organization, the it's, institution. It's, it's a, the institution, the, it's a metaphor, um, as I suggested in the beginning, um, not, not directed in, these, these attacks are not directed at the Pope personally as an individual. Well, I think, I think religion in both our societies, both in South Africa 
uh, and in the Netherlands is kind of uh, a difficult area to venture. It's, it's a necessary area to, because it's a form of power. And what, as cartoonists, what you do is you hold power accountable, or you try to. And whether that, or that is politics or uh, corporations or religion, you know, they all should yeah. be uh, should, uh, should you should be able to to mark them. Yes, uh, but you have to sometimes tread uh, tread more lightly than uh, than other times. And I can guarantee you that when the editor sees the, <laughs> the this kind of cartoon. Uh, he or she starts sweating and has to decide very quickly what what to be done because they don't like they don't like receiving this kind of cartoon. Um, if they choose not to run it, then they look like they're censoring and um, stifling free speech. So what we as cartoonists end up doing in a situation like this is that we put <laughs> the editor into a horrible horrible exactly. corner. <laughs> and um, and in fact, it's happened once before. We have. Um, we have Lampoon, the very newspaper for which I was drawing. Um, and the editor got back to me and said, you know, you, know you, you can get yourself fired for something like this, but I'm going to run it anyway, because if I don't run it, then I'll be accused of censorship. <laughs> this, this is not a problem. Just can you use the mic? No, it's fine. Do they sometimes um, make suggestions? Oh, sorry, they want, I, I'll repeat the question to say it's for the recording. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just want to know, do they make sometimes suggestions to you as a cartoonist that maybe like that little bit of um, extra that you put on the cross, would it come from their side, would, would you take some editing from their side on the cartoon or not at all? Or you yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, look, one of the, we are talking about this, one of the problems that we as cartoonists <coughs> have is that we end up becoming uh, very arrogant and we think that um, that it's our way or no way. Um, and it is definitely um, a good thing to, to take um, commentary from, from the editor, uh, you know, assuming that it's reasonable. Um, and because the editor might have something very <coughs> valuable to add, something that we might miss. I often miss things in cartoons because you, you get caught up in your own world. You sometimes forget that um, there's a lot of people that are going to read it. And so the editor would then look at this and go, okay, uh, perhaps if we do this, we don't want to. Uh, get the wrong kind of outrage. We know we're going to get angry readers, but what we want to do is just make sure that we can uh, defend the cartoon. Yeah. Um, you know, not just uh, be dumbfounded in terms of how to how to deal with it. So sometimes it can give constructive uh, criticism, and sometimes it, it can also just be very silly criticism. In which case, I'll you know argue that a little bit with them. Yeah. The controversy that you say is it sort of when it comes afterwards. How do you, does it come directly at you, or is it by the editor? Yes. Who handles all of that? Well, it depends <laughs> on the publication. So, I mean, today's sort of more digital, sort of social media-driven um, environment. Um, a lot of it can come directly at me. Um, I mean, I, I had a death threat not uh, a few years back, um, and that had to that ended up with with lawyers and that kind of thing. Um, but but if it's a, a, a newspaper. Um, it can be handled by the newspaper. A colleague of mine, um, John, and the, there's two of them, John and Jack, they draw for, they now currently draw for Eyewitness News, and they drew a cartoon last year, which was a, uh, the, the clown cartoon. It got them into a lot of trouble. Um, and it was, the outrage was uh, very, very, very um, confusing because it was un completely unexpected. Um, they thought that the outrage would come from a different part of the cartoon, and in fact, it, it caught everyone unawares. And so even the editor <laughs> didn't quite know how to, how to deal with it. Um, so had they known um, in advance, they might have made adjustments uh, before. But it, you know, you can't, you know, readers are a very um, unpredictable beast. <coughs> so, yeah, um, let's see where we are. This is one I wanted to, uh, to add into it because it shows how social satire, even though it has its limits, can actually have a, a special place as well. You have a, a bit more leeway with social satire than you have for social criticism. Um, so, so what happened this year, um, as you may or may not know, uh, the Netherlands is a monarchy and we have a king. Uh, and every year in April we celebrate the king's birthday with a big public feast. And this year there was a protester uh, on Dam Square in Amsterdam, which is the biggest square in Amsterdam, and he was yelling, uh, fuck the king. Um, and that's actually illegal in the Netherlands because we have an archaic law from the 19th century um, that states you cannot insult the king. This guy was actually arrested over it. 
Uh, well, it, it caused uh, an outrage. It, it, uh, luckily, the government was so wise as to dismiss the case, and he didn't get prosecuted or anything. Uh, luckily, uh, and, and we have good hope that uh, the, the law will actually be abolished within now in a couple of years. Uh, but the fact that it remained that he was arrested, and again, this was great food for cartoonists uh, when stuff like this happens. Um, so the next day, um, a, a Dutch cartoonist who uh, works for a uh, major <laughs> Dutch newspaper made this cartoon, yeah, it speaks for itself. Um, and I thought, I thought it was an excellent cartoon, but it also shows the, the, uh, the power of social satire to get away with more than you can get away with if you just have criticism. You know, if you pack it into humor, and into humor, make it into a political cartoon. Um, this, this cartoon was published and nothing happened. He wasn't arrested, there was no national outrage, which is an excellent cartoon. Uh, and it shows that uh, that you have uh, just a bit more wiggle room uh, when you do cartoons or when you do uh, 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 social satire. Uh, so, so that's why I uh, I wanted to add that in there. Um, and Jeremy and I talked uh, a lot before uh, before this presentation, and uh, we also we we both decided. Um, that we wanted to show some great cartoons that show the power of cartoons that show how important political cartoons are, but we also wanted to show um, the other side of the spectrum. So on the one hand, um, as a cartoonist, I, 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 I strongly believe that cartoons are, are, are a wonderful medium and are very powerful when it comes to uh, holding leaders accountable, to exposing corruption, to expose, uh, exposing injustice. Uh, but that's one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, there's a far more darker side to cartoons, which, uh, which also just relates to the fact that visuals are very powerful. And we wanted to address that, so we'll show you a couple of those. Um, this one is a cartoon from Nazi Germany in the 1930s, and it was published in a magazine called Der Sturmer, which uh, was a very infamous magazine uh, in which cartoons played a very, very big role um, in the spread of anti-Semitism uh, in Germany. Uh, and as you can see, it, it, it uses stereotype uh, and caricature. Uh, well, you see the, the beautiful Aryan lady, uh, and then you see uh, the Jew portrayed as, as Furman, basically. It's, uh, it's common in anti-Semite uh, anti cartoons to, uh, portray cartoon, uh, to portray Jews as spiders, but you also see the big nose and, and uh, the leery eyes, and you know, basically everything is done to uh, present uh, uh, the Jew as, as undesirable and unappealing as possible. And uh, these cartoons had a major, major impact uh, in, in actually uh, spreading feelings of anti-Semitism, uh, feelings of antagony towards Jews uh, in Germany in the 1930s leading up to the Holocaust. So that, uh, <coughs> that's where cartoons really delve into the field of propaganda, uh, of being used to um, spread hatred, uh, spread racism, uh, uh, spread injustice, uh, and that's also a part of cartoons that, that needs to be uh, acknowledged. Um, and you can see that uh, to this day that that stereotype of the Jew is still being used. So this is a cartoon from an Arab cartoon <coughs> from the Middle East who draws about the Israeli-Palestine conflict or the treatment of uh, uh, Palestinians in Gaza by Israel. And uh, you see he's using uh, uh, basically the same stereotype of Jew with the big nose, the, 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 the vicious look. Um, just going all out in caricature to portray the Jew as this very, very evil character uh, to make his point uh, about the treatment of the, of the Palestinians. Um, so that's uh, one side of the spectrum. It's uh, uh, a side, uh, but it's not a side that's limited to uh, necessarily uh, Arab cartoonists uh, currently uh, portraying Jews. You also have one on the other side of the spectrum where you have uh, cartoonists drawing about Islam. Uh, in, in say, wait, this is actually a cartoon uh, published in Charlie Hebdo, uh, because, uh, and it reads, uh, Mohammed the Star is Born, <laughs> for those of you who speak French. Uh, uh, so what happened after Charlie Hebdo is, uh, a lot of the cartoons, uh, uh, the, the old magazine was kind of glorified in the sense that they were champions of, of freedom of expression, and they published great cartoons and should be allowed to. Uh, and uh, although it's cartoons we obviously do not agree um, uh, with, uh, uh, with violence and the fact that they were murdered, there were other people um, in the Wooden in Center, Charlie Apple, that said, well, wait a minute, um, if we look at their cartoons and if we you know, acknowledge the fact that they shouldn't have been killed, um, were these cartoons actually championing freedom of expression or were they actually just insulting for insult's sake? Uh, and yeah, well, looking at these examples, this is another one. Um, this is a cover they did when Muslims in Egypt were killed, and it reads, uh, the Quran is shit. 
um, because it can't stop bullets. Uh, so it's another uh, very, very insulting attack on, on, uh, on what Muslims consider to be, uh, to be holy. Um, and you have to wonder with these cartoons uh, what the aim is, because uh, we'll, we'll get to why Jerome and I both think insulting is important uh, 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 a, little bit, a little bit later. But um, for us, it, it has to do with the fact that you want to get a message across, um, and that you use the insult to make a point, to engage your audience, to get them thinking. And with these cartoons, with using stereotypes that are really vicious or with uh, insulting without actually having a name for the insult, um, you kind of have to wonder um, why you do that or, or why you should do that. And uh, well, there's actually a German cartoon here that so this kind of does that. Yeah, so this was a cartoon that I did, which is an insult um, for the sake of an insult. Um, and it's, it doesn't make uh, too many um, political commentaries, but the point of this cartoon was more about anger. Uh, so the cartoon is, <coughs> in essence, how to draw the president, and I, I drew a dog shit. Um, and I'll show you how to, how to draw the dog shit. And, um, and at the end, I end up by saying you, you sign the cartoon, and, um, and if it looks cuck, you just keep drawing. Um, so, of course, this cartoon went viral, <laughs> um, and I'm not quite sure why, but it nevertheless did, and, um, and this can apply to, obviously this applies to Jacob Zuma, but it can apply to any president, because uh, when you're in that position of power, you're the most powerful person in the country, and there's absolutely no reason why uh, you should simply respect a president for the sake of of respecting the president, respect is earned, and uh, and as most cartoonists, in fact, probably every single cartoonist in this country um, would agree that um, our current president does does not has not earned uh, much respect, um, and uh, and so it's not a, it's not a personal again it's not a personal attack on the person himself, uh, but it's more about uh, his position of power and and the attitude. Uh, disrespect for that position that he's currently um, holding. It's a very healthy emotion for cartoonists to have yes, disrespect correct. for power. Yeah, so, uh, so and w when a cartoon like this comes out, uh, then people uh, respond by saying you need to respect uh, the president, or whoever it might be, it could be someone else, the queen, I don't know, whatever, the king. Um, and the response that we often give is, uh, no, you don't, you don't just, you can't force someone to respect um, respect is earned, and so if it's not earned, will result to um, insulting for the sake of, of making um, a comment. Yeah. Um, I understand completely what you're saying, but I think if anyone Sorry. actually makes that, Mr. Mike. Um, <laughs> um, I totally understand what you're saying, um, but if anyone actually makes that assertion, it's not based on the matter of respecting the president based on what they, he's done. It's a matter of a cultural thing. Maybe possibly. Perhaps, but it can yeah. apply to any president anywhere in the world. No, I agree, but like I'm just saying that if it had to be, yes. it would be a matter of cultural thing, which you have to take into consideration, but at the same time, I completely agree with you. Yeah. You know, if it is what it is, um, yeah. Yeah. it is a spade. Yeah, cool. I, would, I would draw Putin also as a dog shit. Pr pretty much any president. I, think, I don't think any, there is any president in the world that, uh, that can escape um, uh, the, the excessive. Uh, Criticism of, of cartoonists, and, and rightly so. Are there like, um, are there like laws? Are there like laws or limits on what you can and cannot make cartoons out of? That's a good question. Um, so currently in South Africa, uh, satire is very protected under the law, uh, but that doesn't that doesn't stop people from responding. Okay, so let's say let's say we draw a cartoon um, and that that offends. Okay, and that's not always the point, by the way. The point of the cartoon is not always to try and upset people, um, but sometimes sometimes we also get angry, and we ex we express it in our artwork, and uh, and that's our freedom to express. Your your freedom to express is absolutely the same, and, and you, can, you can write letters, you can do exactly the same, you can even draw a cartoon about 
the cartoonist um, and doing exactly the same thing, and that's fair. Um, where the limit, in my opinion, um, arrives is, is when it becomes physical violence. Um, that goes beyond um, expression. Um, because I, I, I might be saying something in my cartoon, and then you come and you stab me with a knife. The, the response is not, is not equal. Um, and, and so the, the line then would definitely be at, at physical violence, in my opinion. Um, I know that many cartoonists and satirists and entertainers all have different um, ideas of where that line is. Um, I'm just giving my, my personal opinion. But under the, the law, we can get away with most stuff. As you know, my colleague um, Zapiro um, was sued by the president. Um, but that would never have made it um, through, through the court um, because satire is protected. He would have lost. Um, in court because we already know that um, that from previous cases um, the, the, the South African judicial system will, will protect satire to a very strong degree uh, so it was it was in the president's best interest to to, to uh, drop the, the lawsuit against the bureau um, so it, it is very difficult to 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 cross uh, satirical lines um, but the best response is to then use your freedom of expression, if you know what I mean, to, to express your, 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 your anguish or outrage or anger or even support. Um, okay, do, do you as cartoonists have like a book of laws? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> the constitution, you have it as well. Okay. <laughs> that, would be the, that would be the best book. But no, we don't have a book. That, nothing like that. <laughs> so basically you can make cartoons about anything and everything that you want. Yes, we can, but but remember, there, there are responses. If if we were to, like he was saying, if if he, if he were to, to make Hitler references in his country, um, it would cause a lot of problems um, for him. And is it necessary? I don't particularly draw cartoons about Jesus or Muhammad um, in a in a derogatory way, uh, for a number of reasons. Um, not because I'm scared um, of, of of my house being bombed, although that is a contributing factor. Um, um, but it, it also doesn't serve a, a purpose. Um, it's easy to offend, okay? But if I were to draw uh, Muhammad in a compromising position, people would look at that, at that imagery and it would totally overshadow everything else. And it would take me hours to draw that. And then we have to sit now and, and have a huge big battle about this particular part of the drawing and the whole message is lost. It doesn't matter what the message is. Um, so. Uh, there would, I would have, within myself, I'd have a responsibility on myself to, to not spend hours drawing a cartoon that's just going to get lost um, in, in arguments and, and fighting and all kinds of stuff. Okay, another question is, does it happen that... Okay, you... I want to check if anybody else wants to... <laughs> oh, no, to the thing. Do you want to quickly finish it? Yeah, talk, talk. Oh, but, yeah. I want to know if it, it ever happens that maybe there is someone who tells you what to make a cartoon about, maybe like an editor or someone who is superior than you, or you just do whatever comes to your mind? Oh, uh, um, yes, that, that depends on the, on the publication. Um, most of the time we have the free reign to, to do whatever we want to, as long as it's kind of sort of current um, in the news or something like that. And sometimes editors will, and often, you know, they'll phone me up or send an email saying, hey, I've got this great idea, maybe go with something like this. Um, uh, at what happened with me with the Sunday Times a couple of times, in fact, with the editor comes up with a great idea, and um, and it is a great idea, and so then I'll go with that. You know, um, it does happen. Yeah, not. And if you have a good editor, you can actually bounce ideas. So, so you you suggest something, and they suggest tweaks, and it actually gets better by having a dialogue with your editor. And I'll tell you a funny story. Um, a few years ago, uh, when I was drawing for the Times newspaper, my editor um, and I were having breakfast, and and um, it was at the time when do you remember when swine flu. Was, was, was a big thing. Um, and so his idea was, was to have um, a, a Jew and a Muslim um, laughing together about this because they don't eat bacon or pork, right? And of course, swine being um, that. But what happened, well, what happened was um, I drew the cartoon. It was quite funny. It was a very sort of slapstick kind of cartoon. And, and it was vetoed by the rest of the editorial team. They thought it would have been too offensive. Uh, to the readers, so the, to the editor's idea was rejected by the, by the, the newspaper staff. question over here, but I also want to just remind you of the time because you yeah, must yeah, tell I us know, about I, 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 my piece, your piece. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's take a question. Uh, okay. Hello, everyone. 
I'm trying to understand, like, for you guys as cartoonists, to have that sort of freedom, do you have to get to a point where you you only freelancing? I'm thinking of a situation whereby maybe you employed by a certain publisher, and they want you to 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 do your work according to what yes. they feel or how they see, it. but then it's different to how you you you, you view it. So, so, do you have to? like go against your own feelings or your own thinking and do whatever that you want? Or you just have to either get to that space where you're freelancing, you're on your own, you just do that. I'm trying to understand. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that happened to me actually. I was drawing for the New Age um, from 2010 to 2012. Um, as you know, the New Age is a fairly pro-government pro newspaper. Um, and as cartoonists, we tend to be anti-government. So immediately that would be quite interesting. I took that position because I wanted to challenge my own satire and see if I can work within that framework, that editorial framework. I was eventually fired um, in 2012 um, by the Guptas who own the newspaper because um, I, was, I, I, I was going beyond the framework too often, or, or the editorial framework. Um, and so they then decided it was, it was better to fire me because I couldn't keep within their framework. <laughs> Yeah, for me, I, uh, uh, I actually do a lot of freelance work, and I do that because, essentially because it allows me to, to do my own cartoons and uh, uh, to not uh, be bogged down by, uh, by what others think. Because, uh, yeah, I think, I think for, for a cartoonist, uh, your own integrity, because cartoonists are, cartoons are basically visual opinions, and if I make them, they're my opinion, Durham makes them, they're his opinions, uh, and they shouldn't be someone else's opinions. Uh, because they, they lose so much value, I think, uh, if, if it's not your own conviction that you're, uh, that you're drawing. <laughs> so with an um, eye on the time, what I wanted to do, uh, uh, Jeremy, if that's right with you, uh, because I need some time to, to explain the whole my piece, your piece uh, thing, which ties into this, um, is if we uh, both do uh, present a cartoon that you know, we did where we intentionally insulted to make a point. Uh, uh, and I, I don't know which cartoon you would like to do, um, so I'm just going to skip that a little. Would like to do the Happy okay. Heritage Day? All right, cool. Yeah. So this one was drawn for Eyewitness News, which was a Heritage Day cartoon. Um, everything about this cartoon is wrong on purpose. Um, and everything. This was a, a cartoon that was uh, deliberately uh, stereotypical in every sense. Um, and this threw my editor spinning. She didn't know what to do. Um, because firstly, uh, I depicted um, Asians in a derogatory way. Uh, I was the, the comment is, I think, fairly clear. Um, I was suggesting that our heritage is changing. We have uh, the, the, the new colonialism that's coming, um, and that would be the, the Asian um, invasion. And, and, <coughs> and one of the problems is also the uh, rhino poaching, which again is linked to, to Asia. Um, so the, so the, the, the cartoon is making, is making the point about um, um, Asians taking over our heritage, which is, would be our brying, our, our soccer, um, <coughs> rhinos, that kind of thing. Um, but of course, um, as you can see, it's, it's profoundly offensive. Um, it's, it's a very insulting cartoon. In, right up until the headline that says Happy Heritage Day, which is um, <laughs> not, something, not something that, that, you, that you should be able to get away with. Um, they eventually, um, they didn't know what to do with this cartoon. They sat for literally a few hours, um, and then my editor phoned me and said, look, okay, we're gonna run the cartoon, but can we just change the L? Um, into an R, so, so it says Happy Heritage Day, um, and, and leave the rest, um, and and that's what happened. And so this was so two. There were two versions that ran. There was sort of the more official version, and then the un the unofficial version, <laughs> which was this one. Um, but it was it was on purpose, um, and and it it was meant to be racy, edgy, um, all that kind of stuff, um, to make a point, to to trigger discussion and discourse on this particular um, issue. So that's uh, an example of how cartoonists um, do use the tool to insult and to provoke, uh, to, yeah. to actually make a point. Um, which brings me to my most controversial cartoon, at least in the Netherlands, which got me a few death threats and uh, uh, half a nation of uh, people uh, who were angry with me. The other half liked it, so it was like 50-50. Um, it's a cartoon about religion. Um, in 2014, I was asked by a postcard company called Boomerang um, uh, it's a company that distributes free postcards uh, at restaurants, bars, uh, cinemas, <coughs> theaters throughout the Netherlands. Um, and most of the times these postcards are quite witty adverts. So, so they're free postcards. They also uh, uh, promote uh, some companies. 
Um, but sometimes, every once in a while, they do an editorial card. And they gave me a call and they asked me if I could do an editorial card on Islamic State uh, to be distributed to, to all these places as a free postcard that people could send. Um, and the approach I took is uh, I didn't want to do a cartoon just about Islamic State because I felt that we had too much in the discourse we have in the Netherlands where Islam is like this evil religion that leads to terrorists. Uh, and I wanted to, to, to do something broader. So, so I came up with a tagline, God is good. Um, and in, in Dutch it was like this. And then I, uh, I added these guys. And this is where it kind of became controversial. So, so is this already controversial or? Not yet. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, this is actually not what angered most people. Um, the, the people got angry about uh, what I did next. So as I said, I wanted it not to be uh, a comment on Islamic State. As such, I wanted to be, uh, it to be a more general comment about religion. So what I did in the background is I added pictures of the medieval inquisition, which is the way Christians treated uh, uh, treated non-believers and blasphemers in, in medieval, medieval times. Um, well, this got Christians really very, very angry because they did not like uh, their religion to be compared to, uh, to Islamic State. Um, it actually got banned from, uh, from a lot of places where it was first distributed, but that only uh, uh, made, it, you know, made it more popular in the sense that news uh, agencies and newspapers got wind of it, and uh, uh, it, it was over, all over the media uh, because of that. And it was actually a good thing, because when we uh, uh, made this card, this was really an idea that I bounced off my editor at Boomerang, and we really uh, co-created this. Uh, it was set out to provoke. It was uh, a card that was meant um, to uh, get people to ask questions about religion. To, to, uh, and uh, to do that, we deliberately used these provocative images and we deliberately made the link between Christianity and Islam and, and terrorism and killing people and we deliberately made the link between religion and killing people just to get people to think and to get a debate going. And the fun thing was um, that as I said, half of the country was really angry and the other half was really, you know, saying, why are you so angry? It's actually, you know, it's, it's, it's a fact that religion does kill people and uh, you should think about it and you may talk about it. Maybe the culture of mind which country one now? The, 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 uh, the baby. Oh yeah. Are we don't yeah. We actually yeah. don't use three. Yeah. 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 So, so uh, I don't want everyone to think that I only draw stereotypes, um, like we saw. Uh, you can also make a point without using a stereotype um, and relating to what he was just talking about. Um, again, stereotypes are just one facet. Uh, of insulting and of satire, but of course you don't you don't need that. At the end of the day, we're all the same. We're all equal. And um, purpose of this cartoon uh, for this was I think for ENCA, I think it was yeah for ENCA. This particular cartoon I was making the point that um, we're all the same. We're all humans, and we should be treating each other with the same kind of dignity and respect. Um, it doesn't matter if if you're Palestinian or if you are Israeli. Um, a dead baby is still a dead baby. Very powerful. I, uh, I really like this cartoon for that. You know, uh, and it also shows that cartoons don't necessarily have to be funny. Uh, it's just you know a powerful visual that uh, incites a strong emotion uh, and uh, and makes you think. Uh, well, I wish we had another half an hour to continue the discussion, but the problem is I have to get to uh, uh, the competition part. Um, so it's kind of weird um, that we're presenting a, a, or launching a cartoon competition that's titled uh, My Peace, Your Peace, and it's about peace and justice, uh, while we've just talked about all this really controversial stuff. Uh, uh, but actually, um, it's the power of cartoons they have within a free society and the, the, the power they have to provoke and insult that can contribute to, uh, to solving the problems in that society. Um, cart cartoons do not solve problems, but they do make people aware of the problems and the tensions and the injustices that can exist within society. And that's uh, also what we aim for um, with the competition um, we run. This is the second year we've run it. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, it's a competition that takes place in over 40 countries um, where we have cartoonists uh, like, uh, like us going out and talking about cartoons. Um, and then we, uh, it's, a, it's a competition that's not only focused on professional cartoonists, so we actually invite um, people who participate in these events to, uh, to 
basically create their own cartoons, to come up with their own visual ways to um, visualize the, the problems in society. And uh, um, we go to high schools, to universities, uh, to, to, to other organizations, and we talk to people about cartoons and get them um, to work with cartoons. And the way it works is, uh, is actually quite simple. Um, people uh, try and uh, or make sketches, make drawings, make cartoons, they submit them uh, to our website. Um, and we get our professional cartoonists to make their take on it. And I'll show you an example. Um, uh, last month we had an event in Afghanistan and we asked Afghan students what they considered to be um, the main obstacles to peace and justice in Afghanistan. And um, uh, a lot of what we got was, of course, the uh, very precarious uh, position of women uh, in Afghan society. So this is one of the drawing ones of the students did where uh, the woman is actually being hacked away with, with, uh, with a pickaxe. Uh, which obviously is not very good for peace. Um, and then we get, uh, we put it on our site and our cartoonists uh, get inspired and, and make their own take of it on this. So this is a Cuban cartoonist um, who was inspired by the image and, and made a cartoon of his own uh, about it, which uh, I really liked it. Um, and here's another one, this is one uh, from an event in Burundi, uh, and it's a high school student or uh, I think high school, uh, about 14 years old, um, who made a cartoon about reconciliation. Um, and then we have an Afghan cartoonist uh, being inspired by that and creating an image. And um, why we do this project um, is that we want to create an international dialogue, an international visual dialogue, if you will, about, about peace and justice. And it's a dialogue between cartoonists and between people in different countries, cartoonists in different countries, um, who have this visual debate on uh, what stands in the way of peace, what stands in the way of justice, and, and how to achieve that. And it's not a competition where you can win a monetary prize, but what we do is we have an exhibition uh, at the end of the project, uh, which is gonna be in the Peace Palace in The Hague, which is a really iconic building um, in the field of international justice. Uh, and we have an exhibition there of the best cartoons, and uh, we're actually uh, also planning to have an exhibition of the best submissions uh, take place in April next year uh, at the UN headquarters. Um, so, uh, for this launch and for this competition, um, I kind of hope uh, you all got a little bit inspired by, by everything we, uh, we showed here today. Um, and you can go to this URL and you can read how you can take part uh, and submit your own work and, uh, uh, well, participate. Thank I think you that's it. Much.